Okay, our next uh, topic is on uh, use of cover crops. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. Mary Dronowski's done a lot of work and extension and research on, on how best to position cover crops and what are all the implications of using them. I guess my challenge for her today is, is how do those issues relate to feed yards and feedlot producers? Most or many of our feed yards are cropping and uh, farming and feeding operations. But I think there's a lot of opportunities and, and I think she'll address those relative to how do cover crops fit into a feedlot uh, production system, particularly related to those crops and some of the timing and harvesting and so on. So um, many times we may think of cover crops as agronomic, focused on crop producers, focused maybe on cow calf producers. Um, I'm biased, but I actually think there's a lot of opportunity for feed yards. So that was the challenge we gave to Mary and look forward to her comments. Thanks for doing it, Mary. Thanks, Galen. Have to unmute there. <laughs> so uh, today, I, as Galen mentioned, I'm going to be talking about use of cover crops. And so my, my first question to you would be, uh, can cover crops be the answer that allows you as a feed yard to buy more calves uh, when they're cheap and grow them at a low cost? So we all know that um, fall time when that spring rush of calves uh, gets uh, weaned, you can buy calves at a cheaper price. But if you know your yard is full, um, you can only buy so many. Cover crops may be a way to buy more and grow them at relatively low cost to work them into your feed yard uh, at a later time. So I'm going to kind of explore some of those options uh, today. So the first thing I want to point out is that in my mind, corn silage ground is probably the best place to be thinking about cover crops. And, and most of you are probably thinking, yeah, of course, because uh, we don't have a lot of cover and you're talking about erosion. But I'm really talking about uh, capturing uh, more growing days. So uh, corn silage comes off early enough, uh, depending on when in the cover or in the corn silage harvest time period, uh, you're able to get it harvested. Um, we can either be able to get some fall forage or uh, some spring forage. So I really like uh, corn silage ground because if it's my early harvested corn silage ground, I can come in, I can plant something that's winter sensitive um, and get more fall growth and actually graze those calves when I buy them in in October and November. And if it's the later harvested stuff, then I'm going to suggest, you know, switching tactics a little bit, planting something that's winter hardy and planning on using it mainly for spring. Uh, currently, my favorite mix uh, for that kind of late summer planting anytime before September 1st is uh, oats plus rapeseed. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, the other thing that I really want to get across to you is that the quality of these cover crops can be uh, quite high. And uh, for those late summer planted species, you know, we can get 1.3 to 2 pound a day gain. And um, for the spring grazing, especially with a little heavier weight calf, um, we can get upwards of 3 pound a day gain. So there's a lot of variability in that, however, and it's really not due to the quality of the forage in the winter, but more so uh, what happens with uh, the weather. And we'll discuss some of the weather things that can have huge impacts on your performance over that winter period. The other thing that I wanna mention about spring is that of course, when those winter hardy species like cereal rye really gets going, I'm sure most of you have seen how quickly it goes from vegetative to fully headed. I mean, it can, it's a matter of days, it feels like. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. But when we're thinking about grazing, management of that grazing, it will have a huge impact on the quality of forage consumed and thus um, the performance of those calves. Okay, so what to plant? Well, the number one thing that you have to think through is when can you get planted? Um, so if I can plant anywhere from August 10th to about September 1st, the cool season winter sensitive species like oats and brassicas 
are the way to go. And that's because you will yield uh, the most for fall grazing. Uh, after that point, after September 1st, there's really no point in planting something that's uh, winter sensitive because it's not going to grow very much. And so you might as well switch and focus on spring forage. So in that case, uh, cereal rye, triticale, or even winter wheat. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what if I just plant both? And you can do that, uh, but you have to recognize that if you plant both in a field, um, you will not maximize uh, the yield in either time period. Uh, basically, uh, Jerry Valesky has done a, a little bit of work looking at kind of that question. And what he really finds is that if I put in, say, a winter sensitive species in with my winter hardy, yes, I get a little bit more fall forage, um, but I also decrease my spring forage production. Well, that September 1st deadline that I gave you is because we see such a drastic decline in the amount of uh, growth that we get in that fall period. So this is actually um, some oats that were planted either on September 3rd uh, after corn silage or September 17th. And it's night and day in terms of the yield. So we got a ton and a half to a ton and a quarter if we planted by September 3rd and we get 500 pounds an acre. Uh, basically it's you know two inches of growth if we plant September 17th. So in my mind, that's really a good deadline to say, if I don't think I can get it planted by then, I might as well focus on planting something that's winter hardy. You won't get as much growth, um, even looking at this later planting date. So if I planted say cereal rye, September 17th, I wouldn't even have 500 pounds an acre out there, um, but I will get that spring forage production. Okay, so I have a, big table here, but I really wanted to just talk about how much grazing can you get. And we're going to start talking about if I can plant before September 3rd. Um, over the years, we've done a lot of work looking at planting these winter sensitive species. And I could have added, you know, a few more years of uh, studies on here, but they really all show about the same result. We get somewhere around uh, one to uh, two uh, tons of dry matter an acre. And um, we can get about uh, 60 to 90 days of grazing if we stock at about a calf an acre. So most of these calves we were doing are, you know, 500 to 600 pound calves um, that we're starting grazing sometime in early November. One of the key things that you might notice is that our yield and the amount of grazing we get are not correlated. Um, what really has a huge impact here is uh, the weather. If, in this case, we were to set stocking, so we basically have a field, we fence it off, and we put the calves out there until they've used all the forage. If we happen to have some wet uh, events, especially if it's a little bit warmer and the ground is not frozen, we have tremendous loss to trampoline. And so the utilization that we're seeing is uh, on a high end, 50% of the forage is actually being consumed. On the lower end, it's more like 30% of the forage. Um, so we do see some big swings there. Uh, again, I have you on average about 66 days of grazing at about 1.2 calves an acre. Um, so we still can get some good grazing and I will show you, I do think it's cost effective. Here's kind of what we had for establishment costs. A couple things I wanted to point out here. The first one is this, the lower blue line is seed cost. And the seed costs uh, have ranged, depending on what we were planting, from about $30 an acre down to about 10. Uh, for me, based off of looking at the amount of forage we get and about the response of the calves, uh, I think we can target about $15 an acre and hit right where we wanna be in terms of yield and performance. And for me, that is 50 pounds of oats and three pounds of rapeseed. Right now, that's the cheap mix um, that yields just as well as a monoculture of oats uh, for about uh, $7 less an acre. Now, another thing I really wanted to show you on here is that in some of these experiments, we actually fertilized with nitrogen. So we put on 40 pounds of N per acre in some of these, and that's kind of this green plus the purple. Um, and that's costing us about, uh, again, 20 to $30 an acre. And I will tell you that it does not pay back, um, especially the later planting time period. So 
If I was planting in early August, I'd probably suggest it. Here's a place where manure would be great. Um, but if you're planting, you know, in late August, uh, we just don't have enough time for that forage to make use of that nitrogen. And so it's an added cost without an added benefit. So I would nix that um, if I had the opportunity to go back and change uh, things. We actually accomplished, we only accomplished increasing the amount of nitrogen in the forage and actually increasing the amount of nitrates in the forage. So I wouldn't do that again. Uh, okay, how'd the calves perform? Well, again, uh, we have several other studies that I could have thrown on here, all of them showing very similar results. We get about 1.3 to two pound a day gain. Um, this is when we're grazing these calves with no additional supplementation other than uh, providing them a free choice mineral, uh, no ionophore. Now, I do wanna show you that there's no correlation between what is planted in the mix um, across these studies, what really, drove home the differences uh, across these studies was really just uh, the weather. And so 2015 happened to be in a, a year where we had six different precipitation events while the calves were out there and they had wet hair coats for the majority of the time that they were grazing. And you got to remember that a wet hair coat means that they have to start using energy to stay warm at 50 degrees. So um, as you can imagine, they had a big draw on uh, their uh, energy use just to stay warm. Um, so in kind of more normal years, we're getting better gains than that, but that's kind of the worst case scenario. So on average, we're about 1.9 pounds per day of uh, gain on these calves, grazing oats and oats plus some type of brassica. Now we'll show you that we've done some side-by-side -side comparisons over the past few years where we were looking at oats alone versus oats plus rapeseed. And this is the mix that I'm really um, enamored with at the moment because rapeseed's really cheap. It's about a dollar a pound and I can put three pounds in and cut back 50 pounds on my oats. So I can have about $15 an acre seed cost versus about 22, $23 for an oat monoculture. And statistically, we can pick up a little bit of a benefit in calf performance. Over uh, the past three years, uh, we're seeing that calves perform a little bit better on the oats plus rapeseed. So I think it is a real benefit. Now, some of you may be thinking about brassicas and you're thinking about turnips or radishes. The one reason I like rapeseed is because it's cheaper than uh, those alternatives, uh, but also it doesn't produce a bulb. So it doesn't have that, um, that tuber and thus I can actually manage my grazing a little bit better um, so I can keep some residue on the ground. When you have those bulbs, it seems like the calves don't really know what to do with it. So they go and they eat everything first and then you kind of got to force them into eating um, that, uh, that bottom to that turnip and then you have bare ground. Uh, so in this case, I can actually make use of more of the, the forage resource. In fact, it, the earlier you plant, um, the better because rapeseed will actually yield more than even a purple top turnip if it's planted earlier. Um, so purple top turnip matures relatively quickly. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm a huge fan of rapeseed. Okay, is it cost effective? And if you're looking at the slide, you're probably thinking, well, I don't know. <laughs> it depends. Uh, so this is cost to gain accounting for all those costs that I showed you before, uh, which was, you know, the seed, seeding, um, the fertilizer, if we did fertilize, uh, applying the fertilizer, the fencing, um, and a little bit of yardage. And what we see here is that it was quite variable, right? And, and a particularly, there was two years that looked really bad. Um, this year, in number four here, it's a dollar a pound. That doesn't look too good. This one's 80 cents a pound. That also does not look too good. But then you come down here and you're going, wow, these look really good. Well, couple things to, to recognize. One is this number four here, that was during that 2015 year, we got low performance. We also ended up having to pull the calves off early uh, because we got an ice event that basically stopped gr our grazing ability. And so we didn't actually make full utilization of the forage. Um, if, if I was in another operation, I probably would have went back out later or I would have fed out there and waited. Um, but we had a lot of groups to manage at once. And so we just ended up pulling everybody. 
same thing happened in, in this number six here, this trial we also pulled off early. So that is another risk um, with using um, these forage sources. I seen events like for us in Eastern Nebraska, usually in late January, early February, you can pretty much predict you're gonna have at least one icing event. Um, these forages, especially because they're planted later, um, they don't put on lignin, um, which is great from a forage quality standpoint. So they're really highly digestible, so they're high energy, but they kind of melt down after they get winter killed. And so they're actually laying on the ground and they're only about two inches tall, even, um, even if they haven't been grazed yet. And so if you do get a good cheetah ice, it does impede grazing. It's really hard for them to get to it. Uh, so that is one thing, making use of it earlier rather than later uh, probably is, is the way to go. But on average, even with those years where things didn't look quite as good, we're about 54 cents per pound to gain. And, uh, and that actually, for me, I think that's uh, not too bad for a cost of gain. Now, I do sure. want to point out, Yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Harvesting that, you, you kind of alluded to this with how it sets up and looks in the fall at the end of this process, but harvesting that is really not an option like it might be. In other words, let's say we, we put them out, can't get it grazed, have to pull them off. Logically, one of us might think, well, you go back out and harvest it then, but really yeah. harvest is not an option. Is that fair? Uh, uh, mechanical harvest. Yeah, I would say mechanical harvest is not really an option at any point with uh, those late uh, summer planted species because uh, if, even if you got them before they went or killed and they were still standing upright, they're so high in moisture that, and it's not warm enough conditions to get it to dry down even to, to ensile it. Um, I did have a producer I worked with and, and they did try ensiling it. They actually had it sit out there for a month and a half <laughs> Um, and it basically got froze. It kind of got what I would call freeze dried a little bit because it would, it would freeze. And then when it would melt, it would lose a little bit of moisture. And he finally got it up. Um, but that's, it's not ideal. So the same thing, if you think about later, we get rid of some moisture, but now again, it would be really hard to get off the ground because it is so uh, short. So that's a very good question. I think if you plant something for fall, um, it is really your only option is grazing. So great, great question there. Okay, so I wanted to, to take a second and talk about using corn residue because I think corn residue is the key to making the system work. Because uh, I kind of talked about using this fall forage to allow you to buy these calves early. And in fact, allowing you to buy them earlier than maybe your corn residue is available and growing them. Um, and maybe you can feed them into your feedlot at that point. Maybe that provides you enough time. But if it doesn't, um, there's this option now to use the corn residue uh, to move them through further into the winter. And corn residue plus distiller supplementation as another low cost system. You can pretty much uh, target any rate of gain you want to achieve by dialing in how much distillers you feed. This is actually some data from uh, a pool of a bunch of trials where uh, they could predict then what the average daily gain would be of calves when we fed them distillers. And this is kind of what that looks like. Basically, if I wanted to target a pound and a half a day, I could feed you know, 7.2 pounds uh, per head of modified distillers and get that pound and a half a day gain. Uh, so I wanted to kind of show you how uh, this fall cover crop stacks up against uh, residue and distillers, because I really think residue and distillers is quite cost effective as well. So if I just take the average um, stocking rate, average daily gain, and days that we were able to graze on these fall cover crops, and then stack it up against uh, corn residue and the amount of distillers we'd have to feed. Uh, bottom line here is that, uh, again, distillers about 50 cents um, Stillers and residue, excuse me, is about 50 cents uh, per pound of gain. So that looks pretty good. On average, um, if, if we just use the average performance, not the average across all the trials, we were down to 39. So it kind of depends a little bit. I showed you that we range anywhere from a dollar uh, down to like 27 cents on the fall cover crops. And on the residue, it's going to vary as well. Again, this is average performance. 
um, but both of these are quite cost effective. And so I think it's a great way to think about stringing together a system and being able to fill your feedlot with um, some lower cost cattle that you put some low cost gains on them. And um, the next thing I wanted to move to is, is really thinking about, well, you know, I gave you that September 1st deadline and I'm sure the majority of you are going, I don't get my corn silage out that early. Um, so what's your other option? The other option is planting something that's winter hardy on that ground. And I did wanna show you that if, if you can plant um, before September 18th, you will maximize your spring yield. Now, does that mean that if you can't get it in before September 18th, then you shouldn't plant it? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that gives you kind of the maximal yields and you do get a bit of a yield decline in the spring and it'll be a little bit slower to come on um, if you plant later. But even planting by uh, October 10th still gives you 80% of uh, the maximal spring yield. So I really think this is a good option on corn silage ground uh, to get some spring forage production. So I want to point out though, um, you got options, right? For spring forage, I could plant cereal rye, I could plant winter wheat, I could plant winter triticale. And one of the things that um, is becoming very apparent is that variety within species probably has just as much variation as across species. Uh, so this is cereal rye. Um, we planted head to head on a field. This is out in Fall City, Nebraska. I think they planted September 15th and they had Elbon rye, which is a Southern rye, it comes out of dormancy a little bit earlier in the spring. Um, then a VNS rye, and VNS rye is variety unstated, which means we don't really know what it is. But in Nebraska, most of the VNS rye would be a northern type rye. And you can see uh, head to head here, the, the southern type rye is much further along in terms of maturity. It's um, headed out, whereas the VNS is not. Um, so that has some impacts here on uh, yield on the same date. And it also impacts uh, timing of when you might be able to get on it to start grazing or to harvest for silage. Um, so I, I want to be clear that what we see in terms of differences among those species, I think um, it really depends on the variety that you choose. So if I look at, for instance, early grazing performance, looking at rye, in this case, this was a VNS rye, Looking at a winter triticale, um, this was NT114006, um, and then this was pronghorn wheat. Uh, we don't see any differences in the performance of calves when we uh, start grazing in the spring. Now, when did we start grazing? So this stuff was planted um, about the 1st of October, and uh, we were able to get on the rye the 3rd of April. And this was near Mead, Nebraska. Uh, and then the triticale and wheat was a little bit slower to come on. So we were uh, about April 9th by the time we could get on that. So we did not start grazing until the forage was five inches tall. One of the key things that I think uh, I've learned over the past few years is that it's really easy for these annuals to get away from us. So if I'm going to plant, I would, or excuse me, if I'm going to graze, I would suggest don't delay uh, grazing until it's eight inches, which actually is some uh, recommendations that you see floating around. I think that's too late. Um, it's really hard to keep up with. The other thing I would suggest is that you uh, don't skimp on your stocking rates. Um, we need fairly high densities because um, it can grow so fast. So in this case, we had. Uh, basically three calves an acre as our stocking rate. And we did a, just a back and forth rotation. So the groups were rotated between two fields and that allowed us to try to keep that forage in a vegetative state. So we were, our goal was to get off of it when it was two inches and to keep the other field from getting uh, above eight inches. And uh, that stocking rate achieved that fairly well. As you can see, the performance was doggone good on those calves. Now, a couple things to mention here. One is those calves were being fed on uh, 
corn stalks beforehand and they were only being fed to get about, about a pound a day gain. So we probably did get some compensatory gain here. Um, the other thing that I should point out is that there's a lot of good data uh, from the South that shows that with grazing these small cereals, um, that salt actually will improve performance. Um, so in, in this particular uh, study, we did provide a, a free choice mineral that had, of course, salt in it and also high mag. So both of those things have been shown to improve gains. In fact, um, providing a high mag salt uh, mineral has been shown to improve gains by about half a pound, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I would say that's something to consider. Uh, but looking at the difference between rye, triticale, and wheat, we really don't see differences in the quality of the forage. It, it's really about the timing of when you can start getting on it. Um, so what's the cost of gains? Well, in this study, because the gains were so high, I mean, cost of gains were ridiculously low. Um, even when you start accounting for um, some yardage and then uh, just your seed cost and, uh, of course, your fencing and, and planting. Uh, so I would say this is a really good option to consider. You can do some fall grazing. We can do some putting those calves out onto residue, taking them out onto these winter hardy species, and then bringing them into the feedlot and, uh, and finishing them off. So another study we did, we used Elbon rye. And in that study, we got three pound a day gain. I should point out in all of these uh, studies, uh, we do limit feed at the beginning and end uh, to equalize gut fill. So I really do feel comfortable with these gains. I remember hearing producers tell me that they got three pound a day gain on these forages. And I thought, oh, it's all fill. Like there is no way they're gaining that much. Um, however, uh, the research says, okay, they were right. And I was wrong. Um, so the gains can be quite good and it can be cost effective. So now I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit because I think that's kind of the low hanging fruit. I really like the grazing aspect uh, because you know I can buy some calves cheap. I can put some cover on that corn silage ground, which has some benefits. I can use um, some of that nutrients, keep it from leaching through the soil, all those great things. Um, but there's also another option, which would be double cropping silage, right? So um, this is something else that could be something uh, that a feedlot might consider. And in this case, you know, planting that winter hardy species and then harvesting it for silage, is that an option in these corn silage fields to do uh, a winter hardy uh, small cereal silage and then a corn silage? Uh, so before we get into that, I kind of want to make sure we're all on the same page because I'm going to talk a little bit about stages. And so here, I just have two pictures of boot stage. And when I talk about boot stage, really all I mean is the seed head is not out yet, but you can see it in the stem and it's just below the flag leaf. So in this picture here, um, you can kind of see it's bulging out because you can see that seed head, that's where it's laying and it's just about to emerge. So that's kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about boot. And thesis is really just it pollinated. So you can see uh, the pollen in these pictures. And that's when it's just put out the, the pollen, that would be what I'm talking about with anthesis. So it's fully headed and now it's trying to pollinate. Um, and then the other two stages I'll talk about would be milk and soft dough. So milk is fairly self-explanatory, but if you take um, seed out of uh, that seed head and you were to, to squeeze it, you'll get kind of a milky white substance out of the seed. So it's, it's not um, hard yet. Um, and it's not even doughy yet. Um, the next stage in that progression is soft dough where you do that same thing, you squeeze it, and now you don't get any milk, but you do get kind of a doughy substance. So um, these are kind of the stages that we're gonna refer to when we start talking about options for harvesting. Um, so this particular study, we were comparing, again, those rye triticale and wheat in the spring and um, one of the things that I kind of thought would happen is that the wheat uh, would be much slower uh, to get to maturity uh, than the rye, of course, and I thought triticale would probably be somewhere in between. Um, I thought rye would just uh, surpass everybody and uh, would be so quick to mature. But in fact, uh, what we saw 
when we planted this rye uh, triticaline wheat, this stuff was planted um, a little bit later. It was October 15th, if I remember correctly. But we did not see any difference between rye and triticale in terms of when they hit their stages. Now, again, this is a BNS rye, so it is a northern type rye. And we did fertilize. It did have 60 pounds of N. And one interesting observation, which may explain why I thought rye would come on so much quicker, is that I see a lot of rye out in fields as a cover crop, and it does go through maturity more quickly. We had some triticale that was unfertilized in another comparison, and it went through the stages much more quickly than this fertilized triticale. So adding some nitrogen actually slowed down uh, the rate at which these plants actually went through maturity, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, but rye and triticale hit their stages at the same time. We were hitting boot stage about the 19th of May, and a month later, we hit soft dough. So we're going through these stages in about a month, whereas wheat was a little bit slower. It was you know, four days slower to hit boot, but then it came on a lot quicker and actually hit soft dough earlier. So that was something that was really interesting to me, that it actually had a shorter gap between the stages, which meant if I'm targeting harvest at a certain stage, I actually have to be really on my game with wheat um, compared to the rye or triticale. Uh, looking at uh, the moisture content, I really wanted to show you that if we're thinking about harvesting boot stage and anthesis, um, it's too high a moisture for you to be able to direct cut. So if you wanted to harvest at those stages, you would have to lay it down and wilt it before you cut it for silage. Otherwise, you're just going to have a mess when you try to ensile it. Um, but if you get le let it go till milk or soft dough, you can direct cut. But with soft dough, uh, you got to hit it fairly early. As it gets into late soft dough, and even into uh, early hard dough, um, you don't have enough moisture. One of the challenges with these small cereals is that they have a hollow stem. So moisture is our friend in terms of being able to get it to pack. So we actually suggest targeting about 70% moisture. Um, so it's a little bit higher than what we would typically tell you uh, for corn silage. And that's just because we do need that extra weight, but we don't want to get too much or we'll just get a whole bunch of, bunch of clostridial, clostridial fermentation, uh, which is also no fun. Uh, so what happens to yield as we delay harvest, as everybody would expect, yield increases. Again, we didn't really see any difference from rye and triticale. And maybe wheat lag behind at that last stage um, on soft dough. I'll be interested to see when we repeat this if that really comes out to be statistically different or if that just happened to be uh, something that happened with our harvest because up until uh, soft dough, it was tracking lot of, right along as well. So I really don't think there was a lot of differences here, uh, but we do double um, in yield going from boot to soft dough. What happens with crude protein is, of course, it declines. Uh, boot stage, we have really high crude protein, um, so it could be a good source of protein into uh, particularly like a growing diet. Um, and we get down to soft dough, and of course, uh, it does decline to about 10% crude protein, but still pretty doggone good um, and can be a good source of forage. So I wanted to talk a second. I don't have the energy values figured out on that previous study. So I wanted to show you some data from Wheatledge. This was actually out at Hastings, um, out at a feedlot who was doing some uh, Wheatledge. And so we did some work where we harvested at different times. We actually started a little bit before boot. Um, then we looked at boot and we looked at soft dough. Remember, there's a lot of time between boot and soft dough, basically a month here. Um, and uh, looks a lot like what I just showed you, where crude protein decreased, it's really high at that boot stage, it gets down to about 10% uh, by soft dough. Um, but look at the energy content. We were somewhere around 70% of boot and down to 60 uh, TDN at uh, early June. And for those of you who think in mega cows, um, you know, that 60% is, is probably around 36 mega cows of of any G per 100 pounds and 70 would be like a 48 megacal. Uh, so 
the quality is still fairly high at soft dough, but I really want to point out something that's really important because we skipped a lot of stages in there when we did that harvest. And really what I wanted to show you is if you look at um, what's going on with the energy content as that plant matures, you know, as you'd expect, you're getting more lignin, you're getting a decline in the quality because you're getting more of that structure of the fiber happening. And it declines right up until you get to late hit. And then what you see is that as you start going into milk and into dough, you start seeing a little boost in TDN. And that's because you're actually starting to get that head to fill and you're starting to get some starch production. So the wrong time to harvest is basically uh, between that kind of anthesis and milk stage, because it's actually gonna be the lowest energy and it's gonna be the hardest to get to ferment because you don't have a lot of sugars and you don't have any starch. Um, so if you're gonna harvest, you either really wanna shoot for boot and get a really, really high quality and low yields, or you're gonna shoot for really that kind of light milk, early soft dough and get um, better quality and higher yields. Okay, so targets, um, do you put on nitrogen? I will tell you that, uh, again, this is a place where you can make use of, of, uh, of manure, but with silage, we will see a response to nitrogen, so don't skimp on the nitrogen. Uh, when do you target uh, harvesting? I really do like that late milk to early soft dough, but remember, we go through those stages very, very quickly, and it's very easy uh, for you to get behind. Um, so that's actually probably one of the hardest things with using these uh, forages as, um, as silage is just getting the harvest timing, right? Especially if you're using a custom harvester because 10 days makes all the difference in the world. Um, shooting for that 65 to 70, if you can get 70, that's the way to go. One other thing we didn't really talk about is chop length. And I would say finer than corn silage is better um, because of that hollow stem. Anything you can do to get it to pack better um, is, is helpful. And of course, having enough pack tractor weight is important. And then, um, you know, I know everybody knows where covering is useful. And with these, uh, covering is definitely useful because it's really hard to get it to pack well. Uh, so with that, I will open it up for questions and hopefully uh, you guys have a few things you can try to stump me. Any questions for Mary? I had one question, but I asked it, Mary, so. I went fast though, they're, they're all trying to digest. Okay, Mary, I think a common question, and, and I don't know if you had mixtures of things and then some that were the monoculture, I don't recall, mm -hmm. I may have missed it uh, in your presentation, but maybe address that, the benefits or not of those. Oh, well, yeah, so we, I always get a lot of questions about cover crops and planting, you know, legumes and, and other, adding other things into, um, into the mixture. And I will tell you that uh, if your goal is forage, um, so biomass, then grass is king. Um, so grass is the way to go. The only caveat to that is that in that fall period, so that late summer growth, brassicas seem to do really well. And like I said, adding a brassica in can cheapen up the mix. So anything you can do to cheapen things up works really well. Adding expense, is not the way to go, which is where I see a lot with the legumes. Um, they have a really hard time competing with the grass. And so adding the legume, I don't see a lot of benefit in terms of feed value. Uh, we already have a high protein system in the late uh, summer period, as well as that early spring period. So we don't need more protein in that forage. So the legume doesn't add value from that standpoint. It also doesn't grow very well. Um, there's not a lot of overwintering ones and the ones that you could plant with the winter sensitive stuff just doesn't produce much forage. So in my mind, uh, cost versus return, I, I'm really high on grasses. And for that, that uh, late summer period, I do like adding grass in, but cheap, keep it cheap. The other thing you addressed was needing nitrogen, which feed yards have some manure. Mm 
um, which then fits that well. But also, I guess our experiences, and I know you've had our experiences, meaning me watching the research you've done, water is a challenge if it doesn't rain in, in strategic times. Another potential interaction with feed yards is they generally need to dewater and yep. maybe runoff pond. So how do you, I guess, comments about putting this on the pivots that they're going to be dewatering? Probably the pivots they already take silage off, which you hit on well. And yeah. Again, that ties together, but it's water's the way to use water. <laughs> is that a benefit to have the water access in case it doesn't rain? Oh, for sure. Actually, you know, I showed you we do have some variation in the amount of forage we get, and um, some of that has to do with uh, whether or not we have the ability to water. Um, sometimes, especially the later you plant the. Uh, uh, the more value there is to putting a little water on just to get it to germinate. I mean, it can be like half an inch of water makes all the difference in the world because you go from it waiting 10 days until it gets moisture. And I showed you that two weeks is huge in the amount of growth you get. So getting it planted and putting a little bit of water on it can uh, pay real dividends. And if you're already gonna need to be water, it's a win-win. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Mary.